Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Inclusive Blockchain Conference organized by Singapore University of Social Sciences. I am R. Senthil, a Year 2 Finance student here at Singapore University of Social Sciences, and I will be your host for tonight. So over the span of two days, the Inclusive Blockchain Conference will feature several keynote speeches and panel discussions by highly distinguished experts of the fintech industry, and they will be discussing a myriad of topics including blockchain and identity, payment and inclusiveness, and ICO regulation, and many more, several other pressing relevant topics regarding this industry. So, on behalf of all our sponsors and co-organizers, and SUSS of course, we'd like to thank all of you for gracing tonight's event. So for all of those who will not be able to make it today, especially for some of your friends who are not able to make it today, do let them know that this event will be recorded live and will be broadcasted on Rings TV. So they will still be able to catch tonight's uh, event through Rings TV and all the relevant information will be posted on the conference website soon. So for that, without, further any, without any further ado, I would now like to invite our, our provost, Professor Sui Kai Chong, to give a short open introduction. Professor Sui, please. Good evening, everybody. Would you help me put your hands together to thank the sponsors, please? I think the dinner was delicious. The other thing to do, please put your hands together to thank the people who put this event together. Those are my colleagues and they are scattered all around. Uh, they were living with a heart attack. When this event was first conceived, we were talk, thinking about 100 people. Then it became 200 and then it quickly moved on to about 700. So as I speak now, this event is being recorded because another group of people, they are in another room. Originally, this event was put together for our students. Fortunately for you, they are having their exams. <laughs> so you got space. So we are recording this for their benefit. Two points of clarification. When you come here, you are coming to the Singapore University of Social Sciences. We used to be part of the Singapore Institute of Management. Earlier this year, the, this, the government of Singapore decided to put us under its wings. We are now a Singapore university. But the rest of SIM still exists. We are that part that has been acquired to be part of the Singapore education system. Okay? So, welcome to our rented premises. <laughs> we don't own this. And we are going through some teething planes because what used to be shared, now we have to rent. It reminds me never to get a divorce. <laughs> I do not know very much about FinTech, that's why I'm here. Because my colleagues have been working so hard, they decided to make me work as well. They have scheduled for me to speak for 15 minutes. You guys waited for, I have another, gosh, six more minutes to talk. Uh, I'm running out of things to say, so I will not put myself between more intelligent and more enlightened speakers. So I thank you very much for being here. Thank you, the speakers, for being here. And those of us who are SUSS fellows, thank you also. And uh, most of all, my colleagues, thank you again for all your help. Good night. Thank you, Prof. Sui. So initiated in July 2017, Scry is the world's first blockchain-based quantitative data providing and exchanging platform for storage, verification, utilization, analysis, sharing, and trading of real-world data. The founder, Eva Four, and a team see the value and importance of smart contracts, 
and believe numerous real-world data could arouse their creativity in individuals, institutions, companies, and governments. So now, let's watch a short video prepared by them. Scry brings a blockchain era to our doorstep. Rapid popularization of digital devices has made data the blueprint of our era, as is DNA to life. When blockchain registers coming in data, a realm is brought into being where stored and encrypted data interacts with smart contracts. When connected data is ready to deliver hamper-free information, a smart credit society will be all around us. Scry protocol layer validates input data from such sources as aviation, finance, supply chain, sports, and business forecast over all nodes for sworn intelligence authentication. verified and signed data source will then be indexed as smart contracts available for developers and companies across the globe to call, share, or exchange. Scry community houses developers and team leaders from seven countries across the East and the West. Our team members have over a decade's average experience in internet developing or commercial operation. Blockchain has a future in being international, open source, sharing, and reaching consensus. Scry Info invites international collaborators to join in our path towards a blockchain-based era. Eva Fall graduated with a master degree in computer and physics. And during a bachelor degree, she founded a game studio and sold a product to Tencent. She also founded Exena Blockchain in 2014, dedicated to helping farms sell, as well as support the agricultural trade supply chain finance, and has served more than 1,300 firms, farms and traders across 17 countries. So ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together to welcome Eva Fall. Hello everyone, I'm Eva. I am Square Info CEO and uh, founder. Good evening everyone. Welcome to Square Reputation Economic. Reputation is the power we now. Your reputation smart culture defines who we are taking to you and which says it was to you. Um, in it means with your bank, we are letting your money to buy a house or a car it didn't mess with your land around, with your expert, your tenant. We know Bitcoin is the best example distribution control system in the nature. One, because of the 
large lumber because cannot be distracted counter by the country by the center of the most counter. The ablest uh, counter is, uh, uh, of the cinch beans very limited. So we can deduce two beans is a disimple's counter. Each two is two beans uh, distribution counter. Each bee they could uh, capture exactly the across the which the rules of intelligence counter. The rules of the which could uh, directly control this action, but uh, we couldn't uh, begin to be action for the calculation rules. However, its uh, action or output of the one B will affect the allocation rest of the B adjacent to it. Finally, the B column will act in as a whole. If not, there must be a calculation center that directly control each B and there on the control of the one. Two is proved to be right. We now in the him sighting a plane of the eyes working in 40 million seconds. We are in the same time. An ordinary night top can calculate for almost one billion times. In the community of the blockchain, or the core bank of the distributing computer system are dead coders. When we write in the data index and the judgment rules in the smart control of the blockchain, we will get uh, at least six trainings of the of the social intelligence system. Our our score info is a beautiful children both in the watching the digital information. From the first moment of the birth, the founder blockchain has uh, recorded his information characteristic. We can be on the right of the scary info to obtain the physical address of the user ID. His conception, his spelling preference, his mobile, macros, models, and so on. The data of the individual user will generate is a authorized synchronization scheme. An inquiry of the personal data will record the data provided to give him the authorization. In the case with the personal data, is a general message policy and legally in misuse. The blockchain data added is a true a progress is a data assist in measures accelerated. And the private data values to, could more cost assist the data support to score info protocol. According to their so one data types and their use of venue. Then they could raise the requirements to the use on the rules concession extraction of the data. For the open secret data database, we provide the cost authentication single nature system, user authentication, in classification, argument based uh, the swimming intelligence. Intelligence system can make the data predication judgment persons more secret and fire. We know the blockchain injuries on high degree of autonomy couldn't be tempered. It's a security and the interest the distribution of the character of the conscience. The core of the secure protocol is uh, promote the interest in this access to application of the blockchain world. In the future, the cash bank will destroy and be destroyed with the smart country bank blocks and funds, financing or companies ID, and therefore from the new bank taking persons are not to force the SNS interactive one. Our data control case to best in reputation, consumes history, interest data, as of October 27th, secure info 
has uh, access to oper operations more than 300 cadence of the dead school manufacturing around the world, including from the bank finances, in energy innovation, weather data, consumption point data, biological data, medical research data, education, industry, agriculture, into of the since data. We have been through the scary info particle based on the few occasion of the China's largest bank credit debt to do the blockchain rating system. This is the uh, architecture of the R scary info. We see the phone one is based on the development of Ethereum, which is a protocol for function model. If you go up the second follow, you could see the data clean at the best receiver. And on the top funnel, we have a scary info protocol that can support the classification of the data applications. In the scary info protocol, you can quick building your once complete blockchain application products, provided that you have a ready access to your business relationship that into the scary info that support interface. This is a best structure we spot. Scary is used for public public is in the interest to the collect and the LS to that. Elmos uh, several post could uh, give the face bank through intelligent contrast can be applied to the decenters that insert, such as uh, taking from taking off and the lighting time as a subject as a smart counter uh, transcription. The strength in the seat for the smart counter to trigger the seller's claims, making the triple political witness financing case which can be followed supported by scary info. Method that trading market, commercial application space. This is our, this is a picture of our team. This is our advisor. You know, today, there's an airline safe country on Israel. We're more in sitting 15 office uh, eggs with a security info, development point and business case. The largest of the, the trend master data becoming calling center store and the blockchain's reputation economy relaunched relations which is a big alien system, which is a new system, the clutch data for the mass collection of a person information about individuals and the trust of his data into a cache. This is a marked uh, hydro autonomous development of the blockchain's Excelity. The judgment of the smart contract system may induce refuse to give you a now, give you a operation intervenue if you have the not post an ID or even a dating object or of the smart contract action are based on your critical ability at the moment. Your critical is the best digitized and the network on the advises to the Disney ways every second. Uh, let's create the digital world is for access to the change block. That is the death itself becomes a subject of the transification, reduce social operation cost and injure the benefits of intelligence brought by technology. Uh, thank you all. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you, Eva. Next up, 
we have Rain Peng. He's Singapore's 3D artist, and he will be talking about the future of creativity. Rain, please. Uh,感谢Eva,感谢大家,我是Square Thank you, Eva, thank you, everyone. I'm Rin in charge of user design in Square Game Project. I used to work on games, or to be more accurate, develop games. You might ask, what can a game developer do with blockchain? So hear me out with this question. My topic today is no more sale entertainment. Time to write on ideas to the future. So no more entertainment. What is self-entertainment? 首先,致敬这位大家都认识的伟人,这句话是他在1970年的时候说的。Let's pay our tribute to the great man we all know this who said this in 1970. 我们要不要娱乐?要,但不能只有娱乐,更不能只是自娱自乐,要有创意,要扩展到更多的领域。do we live to entertain? Of course, but entertainment alone is not enough. Not alone self-entertainment. You must be creative and extend your creativity to wide fields. In 50年前,就能透彻地分析出娱乐和创新的关系,不得不赞叹,Square项目就发挥了创意,解决了一直以来困扰我们的大问题。it's marvelous that he was able to see through the relationship between entertainment and innovation. Fifty years ago, so Scry Project mastered this creativity and served, served major programs training me us for a long time. 最重要的,体验上的矛盾,传统的智能合约交易,几乎都是原始的数据和各种图表来呈现。among them, the contradiction in experience is the most important one. Almost all traditional smart contract business presents with the origin date and all sorts of diagrams. Mm-hmm. At the most, at the moment, most end user don't recognize blockchain, and there is no product good enough to bring user into scenarios. For sure, what I'm talking about is not in crypto currency or wallet, but an application interested in the interactive products. 怎样的一种产品,既可以体现区块链智能合约的特性,又具备广泛的认知和使用融合,我们找到了一个方法。How to build a product that can not only present the characteristics of blockchain smart contract, but also achieve a wide recognition and use integration. And we found a new world, we are going to create a beautiful world together. 是的。实体化场景,整合就是创新,我们把游戏和真实数据的智能合约交易做了一个整合。
that is materialized since integration is innovation. So we integrated games with two data-based smart contract business. 大家可能都认为游戏是用来娱乐的，但自从塞班手机系统。生病system中类之游戏以后，现在游游戏已经进入了我们的日常生活。Games in everyone eyes are for entertainment, but since the seven installed games inside their cell phone system, game has become a part of daily life. 游戏的用户体验是公认做的最好的，尤其是美国的游戏《魔兽世界》。他们直接打出了我们比别人多一个世界的口号，因为他们用用游戏营造出了一个全新的虚拟世界。it is proclaimed that user experience is doing well, especially the American game World of Warcraft. They called out aloud that they are their own another world because they establish an entirely new virtual world in games. 所以在这里我们将游戏的场景与智能合约交易进行了结合 Therefore, we are inspired by them and combine game things with smart contract business So, 这就是全球首个3D智能合约交易场景新加坡 接下来我们看一下实际的手机上的运行的一个效果 the Singapore is the world first place where our real 3D smart contract business things takes place, and then I will introduce how it will be created. Sorry. OK， 刚才嗯，我展示的就是我们现在这个唯一的一个全球的真实 3D 智能合约交易的场景——新加坡。那么我们接下来看一下它是怎样从没有到实现的一个过程。OK， 嗯，是的，我们以 Low Poly 低多边形这样的一种创作的设设计理念，在这个真实的 3D 智能合约交易平台上还原现实生活中的场景。我们使用略带夸张的手法和简单明快的色彩来表现我们希望达到的任何一种氛围效果。We adopted a no poly as our design concept and adhere to it. We are restoring things in reality in on this real 3D smart contract business plan for. With the use of little hyperbole and sparse color, we expected it to be able to present any required ambiance. 啊，我们继续往下看，这一部分是 3D 模型的现框图。是的，蛛网式的各种结构穿插，挺复杂的构成方式。
There are wear frame of uh, 3D models. As you can see, it is rather complicated frame framework with all the structures crossing uh, through like a code web. 这就是我们希望能把更好的感官体验和交互体验带给大家所一直在做的事情。This is what we have been working on so that you can have a better sensory and interactive experience. 然后这个建筑从零到一的过程这是一个非常有趣的过程全三 Next, we are going to know about how this kind of agriculture is built from zero to one. Quite interesting, interesting. so the desired formation of complete 3D Maya model is, is achieved by repeatedly modulation of dot, lines, and the faces of the symbol ge geometry. 当然，这一切都发生在一个虚拟的三维空间里，所以要求3D模型模型师对物体的空间构成比例、大小关系有着很深入的研究和了解，以便更完美的表现物体的质感和体感。Certainly, all of this happened in the virtual 3D space, thereby requiring the 3D agriculture to have a deep study and the knowledge of the space companion cooperation. And the size relationships, so the beauty of the model and the high quality are perfectly manifested. 接下来再说说贴图，为了赋予3D模型丰富的颜色纹理的细节表现，我们会采取一种2D纹理映射的方式，把我们绘制的2D纹理赋予3D模型上。这样的编辑会在3D软件里生成一个UV编辑框来指定
When interaction occurred between two customers with the help of the thin and the big data, they can bring with wider areas of fees related to them, as well as more qualified smart contract business. 在未来，我们还还将增加更多这样的场景，让更多城市的人可以沉浸在自己熟悉的地方，感受全新的智能合约交易体验。每个场景中也会有更加丰富的互动元素，推送的内容也会随着用户的使用而更加精准。In the future, we will add more things like this one, so that more people from different cities can submerge themselves in familiar place and experience. The brand new smart contract business. In each sense, there, more, there will be more colorful interactive elements, and we will push more occurred content as customers use more. So, in the future, we will push more occurred content as customers use more. So, in the future, we will push more occurred content as customers use more. So, in the future, we will push more occurred content as Uh, 感谢大家，感谢主办方，感谢李教授，感谢新加坡政府。Thank you, thank you, the host. Thank you to our advisor, Professor David Lee, and thank you to the Singapore government. Thank you. Thank you, Rain. Next, we have Fei Hu Tang, and she'll be talking about the history and development of smart contracts. Well, the controller seems to be broken, but mm, never mind. So, hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about uh, a breaking news which have uh, just happened a few days ago. Um, how many of you have been heard about this? Please raise your hand. Wow. Uh, well, over $100 million dollars are now frozen in the multi sig wallet, and it seems to me that, unfortunately, uh, unfeasible at this moment. The Ethereum itself also lost, uh, lost about 8% of its market in a single day, and of course, it, dry, uh, it soon come back only a few, a few days ago, uh, a few days later. Uh, if you ha haven't heard about what happened so far, you will probably have some basic knowledge on it after this talk. So, 
Here is roughly uh, what I'm going, going to talk uh, tonight. Um, but before we get start, let me give you a brief introduction of myself. So, my name is Fei Hu, and I'm currently working in Google Shanghai as a software engineer since last year, and probably transferred to the headquarters by the end of this year. I'm interested in various algorithm contests and financial related technologies, especially blockchain and smart contracts these days. And I have already given a few TED Talks in this area recently. The first one is about the hashing power arbitrage in Taipei Ethereum meetup in the August. Basically, it's about some of our method on how to use our bitcoins to turn to, to earn even more bitcoins well as with some risk and uh, the second is about the recent chaos of the ICO market in China in Shanghai Linux user group meet a monthly meetup uh, in September and the government government soon banned the Bitcoin from trading after a short while Another one is about decentralized storage. Some stuff are with the swarm and storage in the Sky Tokyo meetup last month. And each time I try to learn and share some new ideas uh, in different areas. Uh, it is my great honor today to talk about Ethereum and smart contract with you right behind Vitalik himself. And probably the second time to stand in a, a same stage. Uh, so, security. Why we are so concerned about security? So, uh, the personal reason of mine is, I, uh, frankly speaking, is a victim of this. Mm. So, here is my sad story. Mm. Let's go back to 2013. Before I joined Google, I used to run a small digital mining pool called Zipum, you probably not even heard about it. I sneak it into the school computer classroom during the night and turn up those machines uh, to help me test the code until our first uh, block was being found. We call it Zipum because it's implemented in Go language. Something, Something like this. Uh, Zipon is a mining pool for altcoins, or specifically speaking, for several CPU coins, uh, like Prime Coin in that time, where of course they are all be turned to be GPU coins from a short while. In that time, it is still a brand new land with full opportunity, and I even earned my first fortune from it. It is an unforgettable and happy experience in my memory. I could have no need to work for Google if I didn't shut it, up, it down. Um, so, the, the mountain goes. One of the major Bitcoin trader platform was being hacked in early 2014, and the Bitcoin price suddenly crashed, and our miners lost their confidence and began, began to live one by one. And uh, the server cost uh, soon became unaffordable, even twice larger than our income. So um, with no choice, uh, after we launched our service one year and a half, we decided to turn down it and prepare my interview with those big companies. And uh, uh, that's it. Uh, it's had a, uh, it's, it is a hard decision of mine. And now looking back, it is definitely uh, Definitely an unwisely choice because Ethereum, right in that period, was created. Ethereum is not equal to Bitcoin. It is the first general purpose Turing complete blockchain in the world. And I'm not uh, sure it is appropriate to introduce Ethereum to you since Vitalik is also here today. And so here is a major difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin. And I think that uh, what makes uh, Ethereum so different is it has a strong community. 
so that it can lead a rapid evolution. And they, there is something called DEVCON, the Ethereum De uh, Foundation Development Conferences. Last year is in Shanghai, and this year in somewhere in the Mo Mexico. And my friend Chang Wu also go there two, about two, two, uh, two weeks ago. You probably don't want to miss their live stream video on the YouTube. So smart contract basically is a general program running in the blockchain. Uh, and so Solidity, this is the most popular programming language for smart contracts so far. It is a high level language, which means when you write down the code, it complies to EVM bytecodes and it's human readable. And it has some uh, syntax similarity with JavaScript and C++. Uh, it is a uh, statically typed and supposed library, uh, inheritance user defined types. So if you have any of the, that background, uh, maybe you can take the solidity quite well. It's easy to learn, but as we are gonna to say, it's easy to make mistakes. Okay, let's go back to parity. So, Parity is the name of the company as well as their wallet. The company tried to build browser-based access to Ethereum. It's writing in Rust and uh, React. And this is the wallet I used. It is well-documented and user-friendly. And it's also good at its possibility. Uh, give you lots of plugins to have a try, although most of them seem useless. Uh, frankly speaking, I started to read their code and try to write one uh, plugin since last month. And besides that, the company also leads a well-known ICO project called Polkadot. It also lots of hype. It has lots of hype, and they have huge ambition to addressing the scalability uh, uh, issues, which might be the most tough uh, things we need to resolve in the next decades. They have top tier team, led by Gavin Wood, which uh, is one of the co-founder of Ethereum and the author of the Ethereum yellow paper and the, the Solidity language. But now, among these 160,000 Ethereum, about 98 million of them is belongs to Polkadot, Polkadot itself. So I think they probably have a strong economic incentives to uh, help the user to resolve this problem. Uh, and we can't have a discussion about the security without talking about multi-sig. In theory, uh, multi-sig definitely sounds great. Multi-signature, extra security. But this time, they just bad filed themselves. There are uh, lots of articles and video around the, de the detailed stuff uh, of the head as on the internet. Some of them are pretty good, so I'm not going to explain them in detail. Basically, the two attacks have uh, similar reasons. So there is something called the visibility in solidity. Here, the problem is unlike other high-level language like C++, if you don't declare them specifically, uh, well, it will be public by default. So if they are public, that means anyone, you and me, you can call it internally or externally by anyone through a message. Of course, that is not what, we, what you want. And let me remind you that one of the most important properties of smart contract is immutability. So, Immutability means it cannot be patched once you deployed your smart contract. So the first time the hacker takes the ownership of the multi sig wallet and stolen the money, there is also a group of hackers called the White Hat Hacker Group. They notice this issue and they, um, they notice uh, what's going on and so they quickly went in and started stealing the money from people who haven't been affected yet. And they claim that they will move them to a wallet to, and protect them. And 
after until the code was patched, but only a few uh, people have gotten their money back so far. So these guys, they are not real white hat. They should really come up with a different name. Speaking to the most recent attack, at this time, someone killed, someone killed the library of those multi-stick wallet by accident, uh, something like this. And as a result, all those wallets have become frozen. And this time, the, unlike, uh, the unlike, unlucky attacker is only tricked this bug by accident. So he himself also frozen his own Ethereum during this attack. And the ridiculous, ridiculous thing is, the man who writes this multi-sig wallet contract is not other people, but Gavin Wood himself. And as one of a few developer of the solidity, he can make such stupid mistakes. How can we stay away from it? But nevertheless, this time, they truly become the most secure wallet in the world. Nobody can even touch it. The company launched a website so, so the user now can check whether their wallet was affected or not. And it is basically what they can do at this moment. But the community de decided not to help at this moment. In other words, make another hard fork. So why the community de declined to help this time? Well. I think Gavin Wood already explained the reason last year. When all you have is a hammer and everything looks like a nail, then you are under arrest to abuse your power. So this event shares some similarity with what happened in DAO. Let's go back to what have happened last year. If everyone remembers the DAO, which has about a year and a half, half ago, um, about 17% of uh, over 60 million dollars of the Israel was being attacked. And if you use the price today, it will be uh, more than 1 billion hertz. So that would definitely make an even bigger news that it did than it did a year ago. So smart contract security has become uh, more and more important since last summer because uh, more and more people are began to involve. So the DAO, basically, it was a decentralized autonomous organization was designed to operate like a venture capital uh, fund and letting you move money in and out. And the uh, uh, flaw was found in May last year by some genius. And but the community ignores what he's warning. So the, uh, and things going to be going to be a mess. The hacker attacks the door through a recurrent re, re entrance attack. Each time move a piece of them and keep drawing it over and over again. So basically, the Ethereum community got three choices. First, do nothing. And uh, second is make a uh, soft uh, fault to frozen these uh, funds or hard fault and that's much more. It's not a new story. Remember what the government do during the subprime crisis. Some of the bank was saved. Other guys like the Lehman Brothers are not so lucky. So come to uh, come to the conclusion, we have a few types of security challenge in Solidity. And we also have some methodology and tools to help us prevent such things, but it needs to be popularization and take into practice. And some people think that this kind of heads were not the flaw in, in the Ethereum software, but while well, other people, including me, think it is necessary for and it's the responsibility for the platform and the compliant developer to prevent such bug at the beginning. But this is not easy. The smart contract developer as well as the code developer, we need to come and work together. And thanks to Ethereum, thanks to DAO, and thanks to Parity, also thanks to Gavin, it gives us so much 
valuable stuff about the security to study and learn. Do you remember the Litecoin collapse several years ago? It is exactly the same thing like the Sam Prime crisis. So, uh, it's in the economics, it uh, called the Minsky moment. So, as uh, today we are going to see some new type of the Minsky moment, and you will agree, agree with it and shorten the critical circle and cause economic crisis in uh, even more scale. So, um, blockchain is still a young technology, and we are likely to continue to see both the adoption and their possibility. There are still many steps ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fei Hu. Next, we have Mr. Ray Yu. Is the marketing vice president and of the Scribe community, and you'll be talking about the ecology building. Thanks to Fei Hu, our community member, to share his opinion. And uh, I think uh, you all have a basic uh, image about what Scry Info is. And uh, you guys probably kind of waiting for uh, Vitalik to give his speak. But please uh, let me take some more minutes to explain you about a little more about the uh, Scry Community Ecology Building. Okay, uh, from this uh, slide, probably you can see that Scry Info uh, can support a variety uh, of scenarios. Uh, so, but all these steps probably could not be uh, developed by our team. So uh, we invite uh, developers from different countries or different regions to join our community, and probably some of you here could join our community to help us building these uh, these steps. Uh, for, based on your own background, your experience, and your resources, and the great ideas you have to uh, solve specific uh, problems. Uh, step by step, we think we can build, uh, get this uh, community ecology built. Uh, as just presented to you, uh, the project called Scry Info uh, is just a sample. We want to show you how our uh, how the our partners uh, the data from our partners presented and used on the on blockchain, so that we uh, all of you could better understand what the Scry Info is, what uh, does it do, uh, what does it have, and what can it do, and uh, what could make it out from it. Uh, now I'd like to share with you some of the use cases. Um, have you ever, uh, have you guys ever thought of you applying blockchain technology to uh, agriculture industry? Uh, here's the story. Uh, we started a food supply chain tracing project, the Lambda X Center blockchain, back in 2004. It was studied by Eva Fu as well, and uh, we. What we do is to record all data from farm, from factory, from transportation, and uh, retailer on the blockchain, so that the make sure the uh, authenticity and the safety of the products. Xcenter has been uh, running for uh, three years, and it's been serving uh, 1,300 uh, farms in 17 countries right now. Uh, Scribe. And Scry Info is designed and programmed based on the experience and the technology we learned from the, this project. Uh, 
uh, while we are doing while we doing this project, we found that though our goal was to guarantee the authenticity and the safety of the product uh, for consumer, but the more data we have, the more value we see in this uh, this data. Okay, this is the flow uh, for the external blockchain. First, uh, we, through the analysis of the consumption data, we can provide a report, report to the farm owners or the brand owners so that, so that they can know better about the, where their products are best sales and which product is the best sale in which city or in which country. And uh, that helps them to make a uh, sorry. Uh, that helps them to make come up with a better strategy for product and production management to improve their logistics and draft uh, more specific uh, marketing or program uh, promotion pro promotion plan. Uh, secondly. Uh, since we need to record the full supply chain data, we will collect uh, data from the farm through IoT. For example, we cooperate with MIT using laboratory level sensors to collect the temperature, humidity, sunshine, level of chemicals in the soil, and so on. Then use UAV to collect this data from the farm. This greatly increases the efficiency and the helps the management on the farm. The cost of the farms decreases up to 30% after using external production services. And last, uh, the data, the supplier, supply chain can be used for supply chain finances. Now it seems uh, it's no longer the business we expected when we started external blockchain to record the data on blockchain for consumer to, to track the authenticity and the safety for a product. We're going digging out, our, digging out greater value of data from the whole supply chain for participants, but this not only benefits the participants, but also could benefits to the whole society. Like I just mentioned in the supply chain finance, one of our clients in Sichuan, they plants kiwi fruit. Uh, they had uh, an order from Germany, which is uh, 6.8 million US dollars. That's a really big deal to them. They need SBLC from the bank, but usually uh, an SLBC uh, takes six months or even longer to be licensed from the bank. We assisted them to prepare the documents and uh, collect the data from uh, the supply chain, which is recorded on, uh, in our system to HSBC. And they got their SBLC in within two months. The data on blockchain as credit material is accepted by the banks now. In the future, we probably could provide more services to supply chain related parties like customs, uh, insurance and government. Okay. Okay. For customers, uh, we could help provide the full documentation for the customer clearance. Uh, if the seller, the buyer, and the shipper recorded the transaction information on the blockchain, they don't have to prepare any documents for the clearance and the customs can know the goods much more clear than it used to be. The whole process could be more efficient. Okay, for the, for the insurance, the product design could be more specific and uh, riskless. Uh, with more trustworthy data from the clients and the whole supply chain and the industry, where the risk lies is more clear and uh, the insurance product could be designed better to avoid these risks or to handle them in a better way. Also, since, the, since all insurance contract related information is on blockchain, we could make the insurance contract into a smart contract so that when a claim is appealed, 
everything will be operates automatically, so the, it will be much easier. For the government, they could be use this system for the inspection, for the food safety, also maybe for the medicine and some other things. But uh, all these things, we could uh, make it better with your help. That we could do this not alone. After our ICO, we will set up a community incubation fund to get to support the great ideas for these apps. And now it's an era of data. Everything, everyone is talking about big data. The data will never exist in isolation. We often could find out some connection to the other data. But how data is connected to, to and the flows on Scry Info, uh, all data on Scry Info is verified and recorded on blockchain. More and more value will be discovered through different depths to different, uh, for different scenarios. Any acquiring or using of data requires a certain amount of a token, but and the amount is determined by the supplier and also by the market. Using smart contracts, we can define the, the price and the different usages. Maybe you think you are just a user of Scry Info or, uh, or uh, sorry, or uh, maybe you're just a user of Scry Info uh, or a tab based on Scry Info. But also, when you use these tabs or the, you also generate data, and this data could be useful to other scenarios. Uh, just let me say an example. Data. Uh, Step A is based on Scry Info and uses data from Scry Info to serve its clients. But the data generated by users using Step A probably would be useful to Step C. Step H maybe needs data from Step C, E, D, and more demand. That's how data flows on Scry platform. And more demands will attract more data suppliers and then drive the token price higher. So data will never sleep, just like money never sleeps. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Ray. All right. Uh, okay, so um, I just need all of you to be patient for a sh Okay, sorry about the technical difficulties. Okay, so our next keynote speaker is currently waiting outside because we have a full house here, and he didn't really manage to secure himself a seat here, unfortunately. So just wait for a couple of minutes as my colleagues bring him in. All right, great, he is inside, inside the house now. Okay, so to introduce him, All right, so to introduce our keynote speaker properly, I would now like to invite Professor David Lee. Professor David, please. Thank you, thank you very much. 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming. This is overwhelming response from all of you. And let us give another round of applause to Eva and the team. Okay. When I first um, was trying to organize this conference, um, it was initiated from the community, and they were saying that uh, there's a FinTech festival. So why don't we have some gathering to have people who are like-minded to come together and share um, what they have in blockchain. So I put out a message and said, could we just have a blockchain event? And because we are all very much for inclusion in the Singapore University of Social Sciences, I named the conference Inclusive Blockchain. And that is a very powerful word, having the inclusive there. Because that word brought all of you here. We probably have about 600 to 1,000 people today. A lot of people is in the other room. And one thing leads to another. And from a few group of people, we started getting a lot of people wanting to present what they have and share um, their technology, share um, their business model. And eventually, we ended up having a two-night event. And first of all, I'd like to thank the community for supporting this event. And i also like to thank all the SUSS and the colleagues who worked really hard for this event, and also uh, for MES for making um, this together, uh, this happened together with uh, Singapore FinTech Association, uh, SS, and as well as Kaya and all the sponsors that has really come in to uh, fund this event, fund the food out there, and fund the live, live stream that we have so that people could actually watch what is here tonight. So this is something that let us put our hands together to thank the community, all of you, for having that. So the great honor today is to have Vitalik here. You know, Vitalik, um, when, when we have this conference, I have a conversation with Vitalik. And we are looking at the market and Everybody is writing about ICOs. Everybody are talking about prices. The media is always highlighting prices are going out and so on. I think the general feeling of the community is that we need to focus on decentralization. We need to focus on the technology. Let's not be distracted by the movement of prices in the market. That is important. It's important to uh, fund the community for the experiment that we are all doing. We all know that ICOs are experiments, so we had a conversation uh, with Vitalik, and Vitalik was asking, uh, what should we have as this team that he should talk about? And he came out with the idea of decentralization for an inclusive world. And that is a very powerful message from Vitalik, because there are two areas that we really need to focus on. The first area is the decentralization technology, distributed technology, that is the key to the blockchain community. So that's something that um, we really hope that the community can focus on. The other, the, other, um, the other point that we really need to focus on is the commercialization as well as the demand. And that's where we come to the word inclusive, financial inclusion. Because for it to, to scale, of course, we haven't reached Alipay standard of 256,000 transactions per second. That is still very far away for the blockchain community. But technology eventually will pick up. There are a lot of solutions out there. But financial inclusion is one key area that this university support. And is also where I think this is the future of blockchain. Because for business model to scale and scale the faster, fastest possible, you need a lot of customer. You need a lot of demand. And this is the technology that's given to us to lower the cost in order to have new business model to reach out to people who are underserved. And to do that, we'll face a lot of resistance. And therefore, decentralized technology will be the one to break down all the silos and all the resistance so that we can have a frictionless scaling of the model going forward. So Vitalik needs no introduction, but we both share the same 
um, philosophy as we were discussing out there, and therefore this is the title of decentralization for an inclusive world, that we can include as many people into the blockchain world as possible, and that word of inclus inclusion is the most powerful word that the blockchain community can embrace. So this is something that's very important. And Vitalik, for those who are not familiar, they won't be here. <laughs> so he needs no introduction. But for somebody who was born in 94, 23 years old, he's one of my heroes, and he is always one of those persons that I look up to. And recently, he has another paper called Interactive uh, Coin Offering, which look at the bidding methods and I think that the deepness is not only in the scale of the technology, the deepness of the knowledge is also in the cryptography and the style of academic writing. And I have been an academic or half-time academic since 1993, 1990, when I first graduated PhD. And I can tell you the style of writing of the ICO, the interactive coin offering paper, is world-class academic standard. And this is a very good combination of lifelong learning, which we are promoting here at SUSS, together with the real application in the world. And this is the, this, this is the hero that we have. And in Mandarin, I call, her, call him Sen Tong. You know? <laughs> and in Mandarin, they call him V Sen. V for Vitalik, Sen is God. <laughs> and he's really the V God of of the crypto world and as usual when I say that he will he's shy and without further ado and we don't want to wait make him wait, uh, wait so long I just have one request that um, take as many photos as you can while he's on stage <laughs> plus please do not crowd around him and take your personal photograph because I think our respect for him please uh, give him a bit of privacy up there we are all in the Crypto world, so privacy is key to what we respect. Yeah, so give him a bit of privacy and allow him to have some private space. And um, I would just ask him to come on stage. He's going to do half an hour of talk, and then he will be opening to questions uh, for you. So you get your questions prepared, and let, let us put our hands together to welcome our Vison. going to hold you back a, a little bit more. We have the SUSS fellows. We have about 60 or 70 of them who actually help the university and to recognize their contribution to the university. We call them SUSS fellows. And today uh, it's a great honor to have you here. So I'm going to invite the dean, uh, the dean Lee Puiman, to our stage to give um, the plaque to Vitalik <laughs> to give it to you, to thank you for your contribution to the university and helping us to build a community of crypto economy over here in the university. So, Dean, uh, this is the Dean. Yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is the plan. Take a photo. Thank you very much, Dean Lee. So, Vitalik, all yours. Okay, thank you. Yeah, open it up. Yeah, so, and thank you, uh, D God, for the introduction. <laughs> D for decentralization. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and yes, that one. Mm -hmm. So, what I wanted to start off with is um, kind of give my introduction to kind of what what I think some of the important properties are that of uh, blockchain technology and specifically in the context of what are the, some of the specific traits that blockchains have that make them good for building applications and building systems that are inclusive. 
So, you know, like what is it about the idea of decentralization? What is it about blockchains as a technology specifically that, you know, like actually m makes them a, a very good fit for, you know, the kinds of people that w and the kinds of ideas that are, that are striving to make the world a more inclusive place? Then, I mean, after that, I'm also going to go into some of the more technical details and basically just give an, uh, an idea of what I think some of the technical obstacles uh, that, you know, like there still are in the blockchain space that we are still working on, but also, once again, in this context of, you know, like in what way are these technical barriers actually hindering people from building things in the space or hindering people from using things that are, things, uh, that are um, built on, on top of blockchains? So basically, in what ways are technical challenges excluding people and how can we fix them? Um, so, mm -hmm. okay, um, two forward. Next. So the two kind of properties of blockchains that I often like to focus on is, um, first of all, I like to focus on the, the idea that blockchains are decentralized systems. So a blockchain is a system that's not controlled by any one person, not controlled by any one organization, not controlled by any one country. Um, and also blockchains are networks that have a memory. And I think both sides to this definition are important because even for many decades before we've had blockchains, we've had plenty of systems that had one of these things but not the other. So decentralized things without a memory, there's plenty of them. I mean, BitTorrent, a peer-to-peer -peer network, um, existed for at, least, uh, t for at least 10 years before Bitcoin. Skype, the very earliest versions of Skype were actually pretty close to a peer-to-peer -peer messaging system. So decentralized networks by themselves were something that people were thinking about for a long time. And there are definitely a lot of reasons why people were thinking about decentralized networks in that context. Right? Decentralized systems are, can be more reliable, can be more secure, they uh, can be uh, more, res more resistant against various types of attacks. But this is only one piece of the puzzle, right? So we've seen decentralized applications for uh, in a lot of different a lot of different areas. But the one thing that people, in, uh, kind of cypherpunks, pe uh, kind of people in who are thinking about decentralization, kind of open uh, like open source, free software, even way back before this uh, this uh, whole blockchain thing started, were we're thinking about that proves to be much harder than the other problems is how can we make a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer digital currency? And it turns out that this is one specific problem that's harder than a lot of other problems for one particular reason. And the reason is that implementing a currency requires a memory, right? So this is the other and a very important part of uh, the, de the uh, definition of a blockchain that, uh, as I see it. So we've had systems with memory for a long time. So if uh, you use any kind of just regular traditional bank account. Well, there is some computer somewhere that stores what your account balance is. Now, it is a centralized system, but it is a system, it has a memory, and it keeps track of how much money you have. Now, why do we need some kind of common shared memory in order to maintain a system of money? Why can't we just have everyone remember by themselves how much money they have, right? So here's the basic problem. Suppose that we tried to make some kind of just form of digital currency just purely on top of communication. So let's say that we have a system where I have some kind of in, you know, like encrypted digitally signed thing that said that I have 100 digital dollars. I then sign a transaction that sends those 100 digital dollars to one person. I then sign another transaction that sends the exact same 100 digital dollars to another person. Now, either of those two transactions is totally valid by itself. But let's say you had a system that did not have the ability to remember things. Well, the system would see one transaction and it would think it's valid. It would see the other transaction and it would also think that it's valid. And so what you've just done is you've turned 100 digital dollars into 200 digital dollars. 
Now you might think, yay, great, free money, we don't need taxes anymore. But if you were to try to solve it this way, then this, the, the digital dollar would hyperinflate faster than Zimbabwe. So this, this is something called the double spending problem that I'm sure many of you have heard of. And this was the original context in which the idea behind a blockchain was created. Right? So basically, the problem that it was trying to solve is, how do we have a system that does remember, a system that does keep track of the, of the fact that, yes, this coin was already spent, and so you do not have it anymore, and you cannot spend it again, but do so in a way that does not reintroduce some kind of centralized authority. Um, next, one more. One more. Mm, yes, one more. Okay, so basically, you know, now, as a, it proved to be the case, and as we've all realized over the next few years, it turns out that cryptocurrency is only the first app, right? So the, in, like, what kinds of applications make sense to go on a blockchain? Well, what are the properties of a blockchain? Blockchains are decentralized and blockchains have a memory. So what things make sense to put on a blockchain? Things that need decentralization and things that needs to remember stuff. And specifically, things that need to have a memory where this memory is, is common and shared across a large group of people. So not just shared separately by each person, but shared collect, uh, and remembered collectively by everyone. And there's actually lots of different examples of this. So the kind of m most popular number two use case of blockchains is uh, either uh, domain name registries or more generally this kind of concept of registries, right? So domain name registries are probably the simplest example to understand. So let's say that I decide I am going to, regist uh, I'm going to register a new website, let's say vitalik.com, and I register it. Then a year later, someone wants to impersonate me. And so they, send, they go through the exact same process and they try to register vitalik.com again. Well, clearly, the, the first time the operation is done, it should succeed. And the second time the operation is done, it should fail. But from the point of view of someone who only came online, who only joins the system after the second operation, they don't see which of the two came first. All they see is, well, one person tried to sign up and another person also tried to sign up. So if he wants to have a system that, that, that does what it should, if you want to have a system that accepts my first attempts to register the website and rejects the second attempts to register it one year later, well, you need a system with a memory. So there was actually a lot of these different cases like this. So for example, let's say we want to do a decentralized exchange and I place an order and two people try to claim the order at the same time. Or let's say I place an order and I, just, and I change my mind and I decide to cancel the order. But at the same time as I cancel the order, someone else claims the order. There's a l very large classes of applications where this problem of what happened first and what are the consequences of one thing or the other thing happening first is something that needs to be resolved and it needs to be resolved in a way that people have consensus on. So this is what memory is for. Now the second and more interesting part of this is what is decentralization for? So why is decentralization valuable for making our society more inclusive? Next. So the way I see it, there's kind of th uh, probably t th several different angles to this. Now the first angle is the obvious one, which is security. So um, a lot of the time people in the blockchain space talk about this idea of Byzantine fault tolerance. And what this basically means is that you can have a network and this network might contain 100 computers and the network has the property that even if someone were to attack the network and break into even 30 of the computers, no matter what they did with those 30 computers, no matter what messages they would force those 30 computers to send, the entire network as a whole would still keep on functioning and it would satisfy all of the guarantees that it's expected to satisfy. So you can create networks which are resilient holes out of totally not resilient parts. And this by itself is something which is already extremely valuable. Now, why is it valuable? Well, basically because it allows us to create an infrastructure that provides a very high level of security, but also do so much more cheaply than it's possible to do in a lot of other cases. Um, yeah, next. Um, so, what does this lead to? Well, it leads to lower barriers to entry. So 
let's suppose that it, blockchains did not exist. And let's say you wanted to build an app. And your app basically was just an app for just selling digital trading cards. So let's say you had five digital, digital trading cards and you wanted to sell each of them for $20. And you wanted to create a system that just does this automatically and you don't want people to steal your trading cards. So you want, I mean, you want the system to be secure. Well, how would you do it? Would you even be able to do it, you know, practically speaking, in a way that's highly resistant to getting hacked? Well, it's actually a very difficult problem. But if you just stick the application on the blockchain, then the cost of putting the application on the blockchain, the cost of, up, of uploading the, what's called a smart contract, uploading the computer program that implements and executes and enforces the rules of what you want to build, is something that basically only costs probably less than a dollar and, and maybe less than 50 cents. Now, what do you get? Well, you get the uh, benefit of whatever application you built, running on a global network consisting of 25,000 computers all, ar all around the world with, with basically the same guarantees of security protecting the smallest application as what you get pro uh, uh, protecting applications that are, pro um, that are managing millions of dollars of funds. So, you know, like this, uh, the, the, this uh, fact that we have this blockchain as this kind of large co uh, and kind of common resource that's just very available to everyone acts as an equalizer. It basically means that even you know, like, you know, just regular common developers now, at least in the, um, for the specific problem of making applications that are secure, have access to the same level of quality, the same level of access to the level of technology as even large corporations. And this already is a step forward for inclusiveness. Now, the important thing here is that um, like with block in a lot of the time when people m make the discussion about blockchains for inclusiveness, they often talk about inclusiveness for users. Right, so basically, you no, know, you might talk about how you can build systems to do things like giving identities to like refugees in the Middle East or Africa, just base give people access to you know, like some form of bank account, create some kind of microfinance system, and inclusiveness to users is very, very important. But the other kind of inclusiveness that I think blockchains are very good at, and that's probably talked about a bit less, is inclusiveness to developers. So basically, it's not just that more people can participate as consumers, but also that more people can participate as producers and as builders. And so the kind of one-line slogan here is, not just bank the unbanked, but help the unbanked become bankers. And you know, like this, is, you know, this, this actually is one of the benefits that, I, uh, th that I, I, I could see coming out of this in some cases. Now, also another one is, I mean, blockchains cut, be, cu also cut down trust barriers, right? Now, what do we mean by trust barriers? Now, of course, there's different kinds of trust and there's also different kinds of distrust. Now, right, uh, right now, I would say that lo uh, just the fact that it's difficult to trust people in, in some cases is one of the reasons why a lot of stuff just, al just al always ends up going through large companies and, uh, and you know, like large organizations or large countries. Like basically large entities just are already trusted, they're predictable, everyone knows what they're going to do. Now they may still um, do things like collude to fix the interest rate, but they're not going to just disappear one day and steal all of your money. So that's, now with, a blockchain based applications what you can do is you can build systems where you can reduce the extent to which you even need to trust any one particular organization's reputation in the first place. And basically instead you can trust computer programs and you can trust that a computer program will execute in the basically in the way that it's specified that it's going to execute. And this once again is another kind of accessibility, another kind of inclusiveness and particularly another kind of inclusiveness to developers. You can, anyone can build applications that people will be able to trust, even if that person themselves is not, um, is not someone that people already trust. So this is another benefit. Um, next. 
Um, also, social scalability. So if we want to go from applications that work within the context of one industry, within the context of one company, or within the context of one country, and scale out from there, then we need applications where the, uh, be, the reason, the kind of the story for why the application can be trusted does not depend on trusting one particular organization, one particular institution, one particular entity. Instead, it depends on the rules of the organization, or sorry, the rules of the application, and you know, the laws of mathematics, the laws of cryptography, and the economic incentives that are baked in as part of the, uh, uh, the rules of the system. So these are things that you know, like are, are much easier to universalize. You may not trust people, you know, like people in Guatemala, but you may trust that, people, uh, that math works in the, same, the same way in Guatemala as it does in Singapore. You can even trust that people in Guatemala like money the same way that people like money in, in other places. So, you know, basically with um, a combination of, you know, with systems that run on economic incentives and systems that run on math and cryptography, they are just naturally much easier to scale. Um, next. So, the key principle is basically this. Realistically, a blockchain application is not going to be the computationally most efficient way to get anything done. For any application that you can do on a blockchain where you have 20,000 computers if it's a public blockchain, maybe five computers to 100 computers if it's a private blockchain verifying some transaction, you can always make it less efficient, or sorry, make it more efficient by replacing that with just having one computer verifying the, all those transactions. Now what blockchains do is they have higher computational costs, but they do this in order to achieve this trade-off that they rely much less on social coordination costs. So what does this mean? Right? I mean, I can give some, one practical example. So over the last uh, couple of years, I and mean, probably especially even more in 2014 and 2015, you know, the idea of private blockchains has, been, has uh, gotten fairly popular. And sometimes by private blockchains, they mean kind of semi-decentralized consortium chains. And sometimes when people say private blockchain, they basically just mean a centralized server with a bit more cryptography attached. So now, I've talked to at least two companies who have basically both uh, told me a similar story. And the story is, at first, they believed that private blockchains are obviously a much more pragmatic and uh, realistic solution for institutions and enterprises. And you know, they, it's obviously much more efficient. It's obviously has like, better properties in terms of them being able to control the application. And they just started building their application just on top, on top of whatever private chain solution they wanted, they wanted to make. Possibly even they wanted to make their own solution so they could sell it and make lots of money. And at first, this seems to go okay. And they would often you know, like find some, uh, some large corporate partner, some corporate champion that would be willing to be a first customer. I mean, I guess um, since, uh, and since uh, we're in Singapore, we can probably pick on someone a bit more distant, let's say uh, Samsung, right? So let's say some, you know, like someone makes a private chain and we'll say it's something for the supply chain industry and Samsung so signs up as basically being the first major user. And so what happens, right? At first things go well. But then they decide that, well, if we want to make the blockchain application be useful, we have to start expanding it out to beyond just Samsung. We have to start finding other users. And the feedback that they get is they actually start getting a hard time scaling beyond being just Samsung because everyone else interprets their system as just being Samsung chain and they have a hard time shaking off the impression that if they participate in the system, then they'll just be kind of vassals of a system that's controlled by Samsung and Samsung um, plus this uh, kind of uh, dinky startup that's, ba that's uh, basically, their, uh, basically their vassal is going to just end up having the ability to change the rules uh, later on in whatever way they want. So with a private chain application, they actually start having trouble you know, just being able to convince people that, no, this is not going to happen. 
Now, this isn't the problem that's going to happen for each and every single use case. Sometime, for many use cases, this probably this might not happen. But I mean, I will say that at least two times, basically on at two occasions, I actually literally have had people basically come to me with the, with the, the you know this exact story, and they, at that point they realize, wait, maybe some kind of uh, a solution that incorporates elements of the public chain might actually be the right approach. So this is where public chains come in, right? They uh, have higher computational costs, but because they have the benefits that with a public chain, you can build applications where the application is not just being verified by a small group of people, but, is be but where the, the, the rules are being verified and executed by a much larger group of people, including very many people that are totally not involved in your project at all, you can get the uh, much more easily the ability to create an application that everyone can trust and an application that everyone can agree on. And this is what we mean by reducing social costs. So here is a fun fact about computational costs and social costs. Okay. So that's in, <laughs> right. So now, if we want, in actually, if we want to get into Ethereum a bit, like basically, I mean, I think a lot of people have, have already heard the pitch that it's basically a general-purpose blockchain. I mean, I can zoom in a bit into one of the kind of applications that people talk about a lot, and you know, this is basically this idea of smart contracts. And smart contracts are this kind of interesting idea that's existed for you know, a very long time. And, well, um, the term was actually coined by Nick Szabo in 1994. And the analogy that, that he used in order to describe what a smart contract is, is he compared smart contracts to vending machines. So here's the story, right? A vending machine is a mechanism that's implemented in physical hardware that enforces the terms of an agreement. So what are the, uh, the terms of the agreement? You put $2 in, bottle of water comes out. You do not put $2 in, bottle of water does not come out. You put $6 in, three bottles of water come out. The purpose of the vending machine is basically to take these rules and make a big box whose only function is to enforce them. Now, the box does not have infinite security. Right? If you have an axe, then you can break the vending machine in half, and you can take out 50 bottles of water and pay zero dollars. But you know, the point of the system is not to have infinite security. It's to have enough security that doing that sort of thing is not worth it. So a smart contract, he would say, is basically taking a similar principle as the vending machine and applying it to the digital world. Now, First of all, why do we need ven why do we need vending machines, right? I mean, like I thought agreements and rules were supposed to be enforced by courts and laws, and for very many cases they are. But the one case where they're not very good at is basically small scale transactions, right? Like if you were to just put a bunch of bottles of water on a table, and you were to say, if you take a bottle of water, you have to put two dollars in, and if you don't, I'm going to sue you then, well, okay, it might work in Japan, but, and, <laughs> but you know, in a lot of, in a lot of places, it, will, it still won't, ver won't work very well because the size of the transaction is just too small for that sort of mechanism to work, right? And this is, once again, another kind of story about inclusiveness, right? The idea of being able to create and enforce agreements is something that can be even more powerful if it can work not just at large scales, but also at small scales. And what a vending machine does is, well, it makes it available at small scales. What smart contracts do is they make something similar to vending machines, but much, much more secure um, because everything's implemented in cryptography, available for basically any, anything to do with digital assets. And the difference is, number one, it's more secure, and number two, much cheaper. Vending machine probably costs a few thousand dollars. Smart contract costs somewhere between 10 cents and a dollar to deploy on Ethereum. So, you know, it's even with 25,000 computers replicating everything, 
creating um, smart um, and uh, running pr uh, programs on a public blockchain, where the execution of these programs represent things, represents things that really do matter, is actually even still not too expensive. So this is uh, kind of one of the core ideas behind this, right? Now, blockchains are being used in a lot of applications, and like, one of the reasons why I, cre I, I created Ethereum is because I recognized that blockchains are not just useful for financial applications. There is a, actually a fairly large number of applications that blockchains can be used for that have nothing to do with finance. And a lot of the time, these applications are even some of the most interesting. They have to do with things like making identity systems more, uh, more accessible and more secure. Things like making voting systems uh, more, uh, um, more, more secure things like um, giving identity to, a re to to refugees in the Middle East and Africa. Um, a thing, in some cases, things like a, so, like peer-to-peer -peer insurance systems. So there's a lot of uh, applications that are not financial. There's a lot of applications that are that mix elements of being financial and mix and elements of being not financial. And there's use cases that have to do with things like supply chains. There's just everything big and uh, big and small that lots of people are experimenting on. And this is the power of a general purpose platform, right? The power of a general purpose platform is that all the hard parts are already done. And so for each individual application, the amount of stuff that you have to build decreases very significantly. So once again, more accessibility for developers. So what are the, so what are the challenges? Right? So I would say that there's generally three major kinds of challenges um, uh, at play. Right? So the first is um, obviously going to be privacy. And, and the privacy ch the problem is fairly easy to understand. You know, like there's a lot of things uh, that, people want, that people want to use blockchains to verify, but there is this paradox. Blockchains are secure if you have lots of nodes verifying everything. But a lot of people want to keep their information private, and they do not want lots of nodes verifying everything. So how do we bridge the gap? Now, there are different kinds of solutions. So for example, there's solutions that involve putting some information on the blockchain that can be verified without compromising privacy. There are solutions like channels that try to put information into kind of basically mini blockchains that only exist between two participants. There's also solutions that rely on cryptography to basically build systems where you can make cryptographic proofs about data that you own without actually revealing anything else about the data. So you can do things like proving that you're sending a valid transaction without revealing anything else about the transaction's details. And this is fairly powerful too. So privacy is probably one of the major barriers between you know, like where blockchains are right now and where they need to be in order to be used for just large scale applications you know, that involve regular people. And the solutions in different cases are going to be very different, but there are uh, many different things that already are under development. Um, smart contract safety is another one. It's not just that you, that you want to make it very accessible and easy to write programs. It's that you want to make it very easy and accessible to write programs that don't break. So now this is also something that we are working on and I mean, we've actually been happy to announce that we've been over the last few months greatly stepping up our collaboration with uh, various academic groups to do things like, you know, like formally verifying some uh, 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 some of our programming languages, building tools uh, to make it easier to write programs that that don't have bugs and and uh, catch some some kinds of bugs automatically. So this is another frontier that progress is being made on. But the other very important frontier is scalability. And scalability really is important if we want to talk about not excluding people. And it's important in two ways. The first, so if you look at public blockchain specifically, the cost of a transaction on a public blockchain is basically, depending on which one you use, anywhere from one cent all the way up to $10 and $20. And now if you want to send $50,000, then this is totally fine. Right? You'd probably be willing to, to, to pay $20 to, uh, to uh, send $50,000 slightly more securely. But 
what if you want to send $25? What if you want to send 50 cents? What if $25 is your monthly salary? So, you know, like if we want to start getting into smaller scale transactions, then reducing transaction costs becomes hugely important. The second reason why is uh, that if we want to talk about not just financial applications, but also expanding the applicability of blockchain technology to non-financial applications, then um, reducing transaction costs also becomes super, super important. Why? Well, people may be willing to pay $20 to send $50,000, but people are not willing to pay uh, to uh, to pay $20 to like uh, like update some some tiny thing in their Twitter profile, right? Like if you try to stick Twitter on a blockchain and if transactions on this blockchain cost $20, you do not have a good product. So and let's say we talk about the, uh, some supply chain use case. Well, okay, let's say you have a supply chain and you want to verify the supply chain of a bicycle. Well, let's say there's five links in the production, uh, uh, in the production of a bicycle. Let's say the uh, final cost of a bicycle is $100. Let's say each one of these transactions costs $10. Well, you've already burned 50 of, your, of the $100 you've earned on verifying five links in the supply chain. Better just go back to using a database. So if we want blockchains to be usable for these kinds of applications, then some cheaper solution becomes very, very important. Now, as uh, we, you know, we all know from economics, you know, cost comes as a result of supply and demand, right? So if, now, if we wanna bring costs down, there's basically two ways to do it. One of them is to drive down demand. Everyone, don't use blockchain. Um, <laughs> And, but if we don't want to do that, then the only other way to reduce cost is to increase supply. And what do we mean by increasing supply? Well, increasing the number of transactions that these systems can handle, therefore increasing scalability. So it all, it all does come down to scalability. And if we want to go up from having a million users to having a billion users, then solving scalability is, just, is not even a, a, um, something that's necessary because of economics. It's something that's necessary because of mathematics. Ethereum currently can handle about six transactions a second. Uber does 12 transactions a second. PayPal does 200. Major stock exchanges go up to 100,000. So, no, look, this is a gap that does need to be bridged. So one interesting kind of solution that has been kind of brewing in the Ethereum space, particularly recently, is uh, Plasma, right? So. The idea behind Plasma is that it's this kind of network where you can create child blockchains that kind of hook into a parent blockchain for security. Now the benefit here is that potentially the child chains could even be private chains or consortium chains. And they could, and they could have most of the benefits of private chains and consortium chains. By default, most of the data might only be shared between a few parties and scalability can be high and you can customize the system for some applications. But you can design the system so that it still leverages and fully benefits from the public chain security. So this is the kind of system that could potentially try to bridge the gap between fully private chain applications and fully public chain applications and actually give some of the benefits of both and ideally basically without really introducing many of the risks of both. So. This is one kind of approach that you know, like people, a, a lot of people have been excited about recently and I mean, it does have a lot of advantages. Now there are other approaches um, to a scalability. So there's something called state channels that, was decided that, that the Ethereum space has been talking about for a few years. And actually even the consortium chain projects have been lately moving toward something more similar to state channels. Although you know, like in some cases they call it channels, though in some cases they give it other names, whatever. Um, so, you know, like these are ideas that are kind of happening in this space. Um, channels are also good at solving privacy challenges. So a channel is between two people most of the time and, and so the amount of privacy leakage can be very low. So these are the kinds of things that, you know, like we are, the space is thinking about and that are going to be important at basically taking the space from being a toy, uh, being a toy for cryptographers to uh, take making the space be something that actually does 
provide value for average main, uh, mainstream users, and not just average mainstream users in Singapore, but also a, a average mainstream users in Kenya. So, um, thank you, and I hope that you can uh, um, continue to per, um, participate in the blockchain space, and hopefully be inspired to, be, to participate, not just as a spectator, but also help make it happen. Thank you. Okay, we're going to have a few mics out there. Um, we have some 15 minutes, 20 minutes for questions for Vitalik. Okay. Um, let me give it to you, the mic. Sorry. Hi, Vitalik. Um, I have a question about the privacy technology for blockchain. I'm a crypt cryptographer myself. But uh, the more research I did into this uh, technology, uh, the more doubts emerge in my thoughts that, uh, my question is that, uh, who do you think benefit more from privacy technologies, the bad people or the good people? Yeah, I mean, I would say realistically, privacy technologies are definitely going to benefit everyone, um, but um, including the uh, including the bad people and the good people, and in uh, in more, de and I think that it's uh, and it does a lot of the time depend on kind of what speci what specific privacy technology you're talking about. Though I would say that in general, you know, uh, uh, improving privacy solutions is going to be important to add making blockchains be uh, just be useful for very large audiences in general so like it's not just privacy that you want to be worried about it's uh, like the the other like basically if we don't add privacy technologies to blockchains then the question becomes is a lack of privacy on the blockchain going to benefit good people or just bad people or or bad people and i would say the consequences of uh, of, of not having privacy on the blockchain could be even more dangerous yes Vitalik, mm -hmm. uh, you've been pretty outspoken against ICOs. Could you give a good example of an ICO and a bad example of ICO? Yeah, in so, I've, so I'm not outspoken against ICOs. I'm outspoken against bad ICOs. Um, I know only uh, um, small difference. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm also not outspoken against apples, but I'm outspoken against bad apples. Um, the... Um, yeah, so I think uh, that the kind of properties of an IC, like of, of an ICO that um, make it a good one are, you know, like first of all, the underlying project needs to make sense. Um, second of all, there's uh, like th there's uh, probably like properties that have to do with the technical side, and there's properties that have to do with the social side. So the properties on the social side basically would be kind of don't promise things that are obviously not true. Or that you or that you obviously or th that you can't deliver on, and in general, just like basically, don't promise things if you even, you know, un unless you're sh un unless you're sure that you actually can't you actually can deliver on them, and I mean, like, there's obviously a thousand different kind of conclusions of that, but that's probably the kind of main thread that connects all of them. On the technical side, I think the main thing that counts, aside from you know obviously the product, the the, the project itself being good, is um, the token having a sensible economic model. So, one example of an economic model that does not make sense, uh, like, or that um, in in many cases, in my opinion, is if you make a token where the only purpose of the token is to just be a medium of exchange inside of a system, right? So, if let's say I want to make decentralized Uber, and I'm going to say, oh, well, in my app, people will be, will be required to pay each other in Uber coins. Well, see, the problem with this kind of system is that like, you actually can't really come up with a good economic model for why Uber coins should have any value at all. And here's why, 
Well, let's say I, as a customer, wants to use this use Duber, but I do not want to use Duber coins. So what do I do? Well, I have let's say Ether. Then, on if I want to order a, order a ride on Duber, I would basically take my Ether, then use a decentralized exchange and just immediately convert the Ether into Duber coin. Then I would pay for the ride. Then the driver, who also thinks this whole Duber coin thing is kind of stupid, is um, <laughs> is going to use the exact same decentralized exchange and basically sell the Duber coin and and uh, and also get some ether back. So basically, uh, like it, the problem is that if everyone does this, then as these decentralized exchanges get more and more efficient, and the time that the people, during which people hold these Duber tokens goes down and down, like basically, eventually the price is going to drop to close to zero. Now, the other problem is that the, the, the model actually becomes very unstable because while it looks like the price of Duber coin is doing well, well, there's no reason not to hold Duber coins. Everyone loves holding Duber coins. But then once things start looking more pessimistic for Duber coin, then nobody wants to hold it and therefore people, you know, people don't, are going to start doing this thing where they try to hold it for as little time as possible. And so then the price can start dropping to zero very quickly. So I think this kind of medium of exchange model is one that we really should, as a community, be trying, trying to move away from. Like the system, that, like in general, my general kind of, my kind of heuristic for what would make sense for an ICO for at least that kind of blockchain protocol is, Basically, can you theoretically come up with a design where the, the, the system does not have a token and just pays for its, and just uh, development gets paid for with fees? If you, if you can't, then basically you're trying to create money out of nothing and you should really stop. Or at least you should come up with a better economic model. Now, if you can, then, well, we can talk about having a token. Maybe there's still, even still no, no, no need to really have much of a token at all. Um, so, in general, like basically, there are applications where the token, mo the economic model for the token actually does make sense, and you actually can analyze the token and say, you know, like, here's why this thing should be valuable. But if there isn't, then it's uh, a model that doesn't make sense. Hmm. All right, I have I have a question for you, mm -hmm. if I may. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Ethereum as a public blockchain, and for the inclusion that it Mm -hmm. uh, that it gives, as you explained before, is fantastic. But sometimes there are um, consortium of a bank of other things like a network mm -hmm. of hospital. They want to create their own blockchain. Mm -hmm. My question is this. I saw cases where people clone the node of Ethereum and create their own blockchain on top of Ethereum. Ethereum using smart mm -hmm. contracts uh, create uh, all the uh, bad side of smart contract, if you want, in uh, close a system uh, mm -hmm. with the limits of the system. So where do you see the use of smart contract to be no more necessary and becoming more interesting to imp implement applications that are server side in the node that can have a higher power than just a scripting language? Yeah, I mean, I think like, like consortium chains and private chains are definitely totally fine for some use cases. Though the one warning I will give is that if you're thinking of like a, a, a fully private chain where there's literally one node, then you should first basically ask the question of, well, are there solutions that already do what you're looking for that, that came at it from the direction of just being a regular program on a server? So, you know, like are things that are derived from blockchains even necessarily the right, you know, going to be the right kind of solution? And so that's uh, probably the first thing. I mean, as far as, uh, I, mean, I think, you know, like there definitely is going to be value for kind of smart contracting and even like Ethereum-like environments in contexts other than the fully decentralized public blockchain context. Like I do think that a lot of the software even ha has significant value to it other than, the, other than the decentralization part. But that's probably going to be very kind of application by application and, and um, industry specific. And sometimes it might make sense, a lot of cases it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, hi. Mm -hmm. uh, hi. Uh, here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm okay. here, I'm here. Great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my question would be about security. Um, mm -hmm. A few days before the Byzantium hard fork, mm -hmm. a couple of critical consensus and parity bugs were discovered. What, me what security measures are in place or should be in place to mitigate 
similar occurrences in the future? Um, yeah, so I think uh, that uh, there is probably a few different things that uh, can be done to r reduce the risk of, uh, of consensus bugs. The first one is that I think that in general, kind of hard forks should be uh, designed in a way that's conceptually simpler and we should be uh, fairly conservative about making deep changes. Um, and this is probably one of the major lessons that we learned from the Byzantium, from the, uh, Byzantium fork. And so, like basically, uh, we'll end up being more careful about things that kind of change the fundamental way of how the EVM works in those kinds of ways. The um, other thing is that basically like, a lot more effort can be spent on testing and like not just writing tests manually but also ver combining various different methodologies for doing things like writing tests automatically I and mean, potentially even including things like uh, things like formal verifiers to, gen to generate tests, uh, uh, test suites automatically. Like there's a lot of different, uh, uh, different ways of doing it more intelligently. Um, there's um, also um, just the uh, um, things to do with the uh, release schedule. So for example, having longer wait times between the, uh, when the hard fork is announced or, and when the code is released and when it goes live. So for Byzantium specifically, the Ice Age basically forced us to release something fairly early, but like we can expect that in future forks that's not going to be an issue. I mean, I expect that those are probably the three kind of uh, main kinds of things that can be done. Um, hey. Um, yeah. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I am not going to answer. Uh, Vitalik, here. Hello. Hello. Um, to that point you were talking about earlier, so um, just a little bit more philosophical maybe. Um, if, you, if you were to look at, let's say, two ecosystems like Litecoin and Bitcoin, on the one hand, Bitcoin is a lot more adopted and, and has a much wider uh, developer community versus Litecoin. Mm -hmm. Uh, the problem is that the bigger it is, the more contentious each proposed upgrade becomes mm -hmm. uh, and where each small, uh, potentially even soft fork ends up looking like a contentious act. Um, do you, what's your concern about this looking like a situation, say, 10 years down the line where uh, as the ecosystem of all of these various blockchains grows, um, every time there's a new proposed uh, uh, upgrade, uh, uh, the new fork will be centralized by by definition, just as let's say Bitcoin caches versus Bitcoin. Uh, so, on a philosophical level, how do you manage the the process of upgrading the security and scalability without running the risk of uh, alienating uh, the rest of the ecosystem and not centralizing it by way of long tail? Yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, definitely a very important question. I mean, I'd say that there definitely are a lot of factors other than just scale by itself that can uh, in, that can influence uh, the results of uh, that kind uh, of like basically de uh, debates over forks. Like I think one thing that's very important is just having clear or expect expectations early on about what the kind of goals and priorities of a system are. It's like generally, like the deep disagreements don't tend to be disagreements about what the best way is to implement the exact same goal because it's like in those kinds of disagreements, like okay, there might be small differences, but generally if people, if there's a solution that's, that, that gets adopted and, and some people prefer, preferred something else, they, they, they generally still be happy to go along. The difference, the disagreements that are the deepest tend to be the ones where some people have different ideas about what they thought the system is for and they feel betrayed because they suddenly realize that the other group that the other group of people had totally different priorities from the set of priorities that they had and the set of priorities that they had, that they thought that the group had total consensus on so like that's the sort of thing that can only really be avoided basically by just kind of stating what the values are and stating what the goals of the what the goals of the system are ahead of time 
So like we in Ethereum, for example, tried to do this by talking about things like proof of stake and sharding starting very or starting very early on, just to make it clear that you know like these things are part of the roadmap and part of what we want to build. And there's plenty of people that are that are not okay with proof of stake, and that's totally fine. And there's other chains that. And like other, you know, like, uh, other, like, uh, other systems uh, that are not going to go in the same direction. Like I heard Ethereum Classic just had a great conference in Hong Kong yesterday. So it's um, um, also, I would say the other thing is that like in Bitcoin specifically, it was also, I, I think, exacerbated early on because a lot of people had this maximalist mentality that kind of network effects mean everything and Bitcoin needs to be the only coin. And the problem is that if you have this mentality that something needs to be the only coin, then like basically that creates this thing that people think is super valuable and they're basically willing to almost risk their lives to fight over it. Whereas, in, and it makes it very hard to have things like a peaceful split. <clears throat> Whereas if you have the mentality that, well, multiple blockchains are okay, then, you know, like pe peaceful splits can happen and I mean, hopefully they can be I, like, you know, like safe, resolved peacefully, and also fairly rare. Um, so, I would say those are probably the main things. Um, can you please uh, give your comment uh, on the recent uh, Segwit uh, 2x uh, cancellation, please? Um, how about no? <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Yeah. Uh, hi, Vitalik. Uh, yes. Um, no. I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, I just wanted to gather your thoughts on uh, quantum computing because some people say that quantum computing could cripple the encryption of Bitcoin. Sorry, what was that? I didn't hear the question well. Uh, I just want to gather your thoughts on quantum computing because some people actually say that quantum computing could cripple the encryption of Bitcoin and yeah, do you think that you will um, pose a threat to Ethereum? So first of all, it's not at all clear that quantum computers are very close yet. I mean, I know there are plenty of marketing announcements every year about how, oh, fancy company did a quantum computer that has, you know, like 55 qubits or whatever. But most of the time, those quantum computers are either not real quantum computers or adiabatic quantum computers, or they, I mean, they might not, they might be like closer to real, but there's still some caveats, right? Like people talk about 50, 50 qubit quantum computers, but no one's talking about, oh, we can use this to factor a number bigger than 35. So like my personal opinion is that it's still going to be some time before we get to the point where we have quantum computers that are capable, that, are, that actually have enough qubits entangled to be capable of doing things that classical computers uh, can't, do, uh, can't do very quickly. When that does happen, like the other important thing to keep in mind is that quantum computers are not a magical device that lets you basically try every possible answer at the same time. Right? Quantum computers are a device that lets you try, like, solve very specific computational problems that can't be solved easily on a classical computer, but not all computational problems. And there is an entire branch of cryptography that tries to make algorithms that cannot be efficiently broken by quantum computers. So, like with Ethereum, the general roadmap that we're going in the long term is that we're trying to move toward a system where basically anyone can use whatever um, uh, digital signature algorithm they want for their own account. And so that way, basically people would be able to migrate to quantum resistant algorithms on their own individually. Hi, uh, Vitalik. Uh, yeah. So for your, for your information, I am the guy who stand here uh, speaking be before you coming. So uh, about the uh, topic uh, with the recent uh, uh, parity, multi-secret wallet hack. So I know you didn't want to ask, uh, answer the, uh, the question about the parity. Look, so, I promised on Twitter not to talk so about I, the four up forks. I will not talk about forks. Yes, so I'm not going to uh, ask the question about parity. Uh -huh. So uh, I am... <laughs> I am working in Google and today is a working day. So it is uh, so hard for me to come here today uh, because I have already run out of my vacations. Mm -hmm. So I need to my managers approve to have a unpaid uh, vacation to come here. But uh, 
I didn't got my uh, manager's approved. Uh, and he said, uh, you need to work in the office and uh, to uh, 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 improve your Yeah, tell performance. your manager I think you're cool and you're so gonna come here. I talked to him, so, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk behind, okay. right behind I, I think Vitalik. there are a few more questions. So, <laughs> Vitalik, uh, we're going to have to take more, two more questions. Okay. I'll let you, there's one gentleman here, you, okay. you choose the last one. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I'm going to listen and talk about Vitalik. How can I refuse to come in to uh, say Vitalik? And, uh, uh, so, uh, Sorry, to make can, a can we give <laughs> a chance to Essential. the gentleman here? Thank you very much. <laughs> One question here, yeah. and then Vitaly, you choose the last one. Uh, okay. uh, hi, Vitaly. Uh, you didn't talk about the move of, from uh, proof of work to proof of stake. So I would like to ask, right? So how do you reconcile the fact that when you move to proof of stake, it's likely to encourage more centralization of staker? And that definitely is a risk, although the thing I usually point out is that proof of work also does have fairly high concentration of miners. And if you look at, like, the, even the Bitcoin ecosystem, like there, the number of of actual on like mining hardware operators is fairly small. Um, so, whereas with a, a proof of stake system, like basically anyone that has ether can participate in the process. So, in like my personal opinion is that in general it is going to be more decentralized. Though the other important point is that proof of stake algorithms are designed in such a way that even if a 51% attack does happen, the blockchain can recover from it much more easily. So that's the other kind of important pillar that I think is, impo um, is important there. Okay, last question. Mm -hmm. Hey. Uh, where do you get shares from and where can I buy them? Um, this one, I forget, what, um, it's from a company, okay, fine, I can't read the label, <laughs> um, on the internet. <laughs> mm -hmm, thank you. Okay, um, I think we are running out of time. Um, I must thank Ethereum Singapore. I, I, must, I must not forget that. And also thank um, the sponsor Qtum, Consensus, Pundi, uh, Fambushi, and Blog Asset. And most of all, let us put our hands together to thank Vitalik for a very exciting one. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much. We will see you tomorrow. We start at 3.45 tomorrow. A parallel five sessions. So, good night and a good evening. Thank you.